we're definitely seeing a shift in people wanting, you know, kind of different, more modern type spaces, which is fun. Business of Architecture, episode 379. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking to Marilyn Damore, who is the co-founder of interior design firm and construction firm Damore Drake, who have an impressive portfolio of work ranging from Brooklyn lofts to even an 18th century cathedral in Haiti, which had been damaged in the 2010 earthquake. In a previous life, Marilyn worked for many years in marketing and business development and public relations for firms such as Deloitte, Ernst & Young, PwC and Accenture. And in this interview we discuss how she's been growing her firm and also we take a look at her initiative in the Kingston Design Connection and its showcase project the Kingston Design Showhouse which has brought together a community of fellow designers, makers, artists and retailers who connect, promote, collaborate and support each other. The Kingston Design Connection supports local businesses and is rapidly growing along with the annual showhouse event which is discussed in detail here. So this is a really fabulous initiative and I thoroughly enjoyed talking to Marilyn and she shares a lot about her entrepreneurial methodologies and spirit. So sit back, relax and enjoy Marilyn Damore. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Marilyn, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. Very good. Now, you are the founder of Damore Drake. You are also the founder of the Kingston Design Show House. You're based out in the, on the, in the East Coast in the US, up in the Hudson Valley in, the, in New York State. Um, you're an interior designer. Um, and I suppose the first question is, how did you, how did you, how did your business start? How did the more Drake start? And then we can talk a little bit about the, about the show house. Cause this is, this is a really interesting innovation. <laughs> Well, I hope it's, it's interesting for people to listen to. Um, but yeah, so Demore Drake actually is um, a company that I bought into. So when I decided to be an interior designer, I was living in New York City. And that's where I went to, to design school. Mm. And um, once I was done with school, it occurred to me very quickly that I could not ever really make a go of having my own design firm in the city because it's Manhattan and prices are insane. Yeah. Um, or they were. They've gotten a little better, but they were pretty crazy, you know, six, seven years ago when I was just starting out. And um, I'd had a house in the Hudson Valley, a weekend house. And so for a variety of reasons, I decided to move to the Hudson Valley. So I live in Kingston, which is about two hours north of Manhattan. Right. And while in school, I had a couple of design projects that came up and I'd hired um, Fred Drake, who's now my partner. So our, so our company is Demore Drake. Yeah. So I run the, I run the interior design side of the business and he runs the construction side. Got it. So, so I'd hired him to come and work with me on these two projects. So then when I was done with school, a few years later, I was like, Oh, wait a minute. Like this would be a really great compliment. Um, <clears throat> you know, because everybody hears about design build firms. Um, but there are so many just synergies, um, and ways that it makes the interior designer's job easier to mm. actually have, a, you know, your own construction team. Yeah. Um, you know, it's people that we work with all the time. You know, we have, you know, in-house, we build houses from the ground up and we do interiors. So um, over the past six years, we've done a number of projects. And it's really great that, you know, I have a team that I know the quality of their work. I can rely on them, et cetera. So that's kind of how Demore Drake started. How, how did you and um, Fred first meet? Um, we actually met socially. We met out at, at a bar in Kingston. Um, right. he, uh, yeah, he asked me to dance. And then I found out <laughs> he, was a, he, he was a construction worker. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to stay in touch with you. And then um, I wound up, you know, sort of reaching out to him about a year later or something. Oh, brilliant. I love it. Now, you had a, um, had a, past, a past career, am I right? You worked for Deloitte and Ernst Young's and PwC. Yep, yep. In, in PR and business, and business development? Yeah, yeah, mostly uh, everything communications related. So I've done external communications, so PR, crisis management, 
um, internal communications, marketing. Yeah, so I basically spent about 15 years kind of cycling through all these global consulting firms, um, you know, basically being a writer, which is really what kind of PR and marketing is, it's the bulk of that work. So that's kind of outside of interior design, that's kind of the only thing I've been paid to do. Yeah. Was that experience working for those firms useful? How did you use that some of that experience when marketing your own uh, design firm? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I spent 15 years basically working with some of the biggest companies, you know, on the planet. So my mm -hmm. last company, Accenture, for example, when I moved up to Kingston, it was really funny to find out that the entire town of Kingston had fewer people than my last company. We had about 300,000 people. Um, so, you know, I'm used to creating kind of large strategic campaigns, you know, global campaigns. Mm -hmm. So having had that experience um, to be able to kind of scale that, um, you know, for a business, because our, our business is just US based. Um, yeah, that was something that came in super handy, everything from graphic design to, you know, marketing copy, sort of strategic planning, all that good stuff. When, when you first started to more Drake, how were you winning those initial projects? Um, I didn't. So, so the Kingston Design Show House literally came out of the fact that when I moved up here, so I moved up here, we rebranded and started the company in 2016. So at the time, um, there wasn't as much interior design happening mm -hmm. as there is now. And so the bulk of our, you know, I spent the first year, I, I never got one design project the entire first year. Right. And, um, you know, on the construction side, people build houses in the Hudson Valley all the time. But until more recently, interior design hasn't hadn't really been a focus. So people would, you know, hire Fred to build their house or renovate, whatever. And then they would just pick their own finishes. Mm -hmm. Um over the years, and I think partly because we've had a lot of people from New York City and elsewhere, people who are used to buying interior design services, we've seen a huge sort of change um, in terms of, you know, the people asking for more of interior design. Um, but that first year, I spent an entire year just trying to figure out how to, you know, meet people, get clients. And it just drove me crazy because on the construction side, it's a very tight knit community. All yeah. those companies, all those guys know each other. So they hire each other, all that good stuff. So my partner, he'd had, a, he'd had his own company for about 10 years, for a little bit more than a decade. He had never advertised. He'd never even had a business card mm. because that connected community kind of, you know, that word of mouth sort of did that job for them. Um, and so, you know, at a certain point, I started just going to design events because I thought, well, I need to meet landscape designers, makers, you know architects, all these people who I need to know to actually do my job. And since I couldn't find anybody, I thought, well, let me just kind of go to a bunch of design events and I'll see, you know, that could be a way to meet folks. And there are a bunch of amazing design events in the Hudson Valley. And so I started doing that and just started talking to people at fairs and things and asking them, you know, various makers and artists, how they were kind of meeting folks in the design build space. Um, and it was very interesting because it turned out that everybody was having the same problem that I was having, that even kind of very established, there are some well-known designers and makers who live up here. Yeah. And even those kind of very established folks were working by themselves. Um, and people who had been living here for 10 plus years really did not have kind of a network or community of uh, designers. And so once I realized that it wasn't just me that couldn't figure out how to you know, kind of get this thing going, I sort of did um, sort of a year long research to try and sort of understand because I, you know, because I couldn't find client work. Right. So I was like, OK, let me take this time and try to figure this out, because um, as a lot of people know, the Hudson Valley has been talked about in terms of interior design and, you know, creatives moving up. We've had a huge population of creatives moving up here over the past decade. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs, people starting you know, their own design shops and things. And it was odd to me that there was this huge concentration of people, mm -hmm. but they all, but nobody really knew each other. Right. Um, so I kind of did this year long research where I went to all these design events, you know, tried to assess them to see like where, where kind of the connection was happening, where it wasn't happening. Um, you know, what was working, what wasn't working about the various design mm -hmm. events, talk to a lot of people. And then, you know, the big takeaway for me was that if there was some kind of a mechanism that could bring all these design build folks together, 
and not for a networking thing because, you know, those tend to not really net into actual business relationships for the most part. Um, I thought, well, if we could find a way to bring all these folks together in a physical location to do something together, that would be amazing. And then the idea of a show house um, occurred to me because that's the exact thing that show houses do. You know, so you, you're a designer in a, in a show house, you have a space and you have to go out and get, mm. you know, lighting designers, you know, all these folks, contractors, you know, fine artists for artwork, you know, wallpaper hangers. You have to kind of create that and meet those folks to do your space. Um, so I started the first design show house in 2018. Um, we had about 10 participants, so 10 main designers owning 10 different spaces inside and outside. Um, and then, you know, if you think about how much stuff you need in a room, each designer was working with 10, 15 makers. So we had over 100 participants, everybody from local, you know, vendors to contractors to all, all that stuff. And so we did the first design show house in 2018. And at the end of the show house, I thought, well, this is really wonderful. Like I've met over a hundred people. I'm now connected with all these folks. This is great. You know, now I can get back to my day job. And then after the show house happened, um, we started getting a lot of press and, and there continued to be a lot of interest. And so I just kept sort of doing it. Um, and so this year we're in our fourth year. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was interesting that you said um, that there was a, a, a kind of traditional networking events often don't, end up in projects as such. What, what are some of the problems that you found with that or one, some of the reasons why you think that is with tradi traditional modes of networking and meeting people? Um, well, you know, the two main things that I found up here were we, we have a lot of fairs where makers will have booths and they'll sell things. Yeah. So they're, so they're all co-located, right? So I could be in a booth right next to you, but the focus is on, you know, interaction with the public. Right. So I could be co-located with you for a weekend but there's no chance for us to meet because the focus of that is not about making those connections. Yeah. Um, you know, on the networking event side, you know, part of it is just me because I'm, I'm not that kind of a social person. Mm -hmm. um, but also if you think about, you know, we're all visual people. So to have a networking sort of, an, you know, s event with visual folks where I'm explaining to you what I do, we want to see the work, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a very different thing. I think, you know, if there are some industries where it lends itself more to that kind of networking event, but, you know, if I'm talking to a lighting designer, I want to see what you, you know what I mean? I want to see your work. I want to hold it. I want to touch it and all that good stuff. Um, you know, so the show house provides that opportunity for people to, you know, usually it takes about three weeks or so to do a room. So for three weeks, you're now dealing with talking to borrowing items from creating custom pieces with 14, 15 makers. And you're not only kind of meeting them socially, but now you're getting a sense of not just the quality of their work, but whether you can have a relationship, mm. a business relationship with them, you know? So, yeah. So it's almost like you're, you're getting to kind of test the relationship mm -hmm. out in a Absolutely. scenario. Brilliant. Yep, yep, yep. But, so tell me a little bit about how the, the, the first one came about, like in terms of the house and what yes. was required. So the first one was was interesting because generally the way show houses work and, you know, show houses have been around forever. Yeah. Um, so like uh, there's the one of the most famous ones is called Kipps Bay Decorator Show House. Mm -hmm. It's in New York City. Um, so they've been around for about 75 years. And what they do is they basically just because they, they can, you know, they just bought a $20 million mansion on the Upper East Side and that's the house they use. So mm -hmm. every year they have a show house and then everything gets ripped out because they use the same sort of townhouse. Um, I know out in California, for example, they have a slightly different model because people had just have lots and lots of space. And so, you know, out on the West Coast, you'll see a lot of design show houses um, will have, first of all, incredibly massively large houses, but also a lot of times um, they work with a developer where, you know, the spec, spec house gets used and then that gets sold afterwards. Um, but coming up to the Hudson Valley, we didn't really have that kind of a market up here. Yeah. And so, you know, and I couldn't afford to just buy a house to do it, although that's kind of what happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, once I had the idea to do the show house, I basically started, you know, thinking about, OK, well, I need to find a house. How am I going to do that? 
And I thought I would open it up to the public because, you know, in Kingston, which is where the show house is every year, it's one of the oldest cities in the country. Um, so we have stone houses from the 1600s. We have federal style houses, Greek revival. There's like just an amazing wealth of architecture. And, you know, all these people own them. And I thought, well, maybe that that would work. Um, but it turned out that people were not really used to the idea of a show house. A lot of folks didn't know what a show house was, had never been. So it was impossible, literally impossible to explain to somebody what we were trying to achieve. And then can I borrow your house for two months and you have to leave and all your furniture has to leave, right? <laughs> and people were like, that sounds insane. Um, and so, yeah, so I could not find a house the first year. And right around the time when I would have had to not do it because you know the show house takes about three months of like solid production. Um, and so right around the time when I almost was like, well, maybe I'm going to have to wait another year because I, it's, you know, I can't find a house. Um, at the last minute, it occurred to me that I had had a house in Kingston. So when I moved to Kingston, um, I bought a rental property because not knowing how long it would take to get the interior design side of the practice off yeah. the ground, I thought, well, I could use some passive income. So I'd had a rental property, hadn't really done much with it. We, you know, I didn't have tenants even, and I was kind of slowly sort of doing some fixes. Um, but it was a very lovely house, a Victorian house from the 1850s. It was in pretty bad shape, but it was a beautiful house. Is this and, the, the 139 Down Street? One? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and luckily, because, you know, I, I'm part of a construction team, I kind of wrangled Fred Drake, my partner, to help me do all of the exterior work. Um, and so very weirdly, we wound up using my house the first year. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And, and so how, how much of a success was it? And, and how were you gauging what success was? Um, you know, so I remember the first year when I would, because I went and spoke to everybody. I, I spoke to local businesses, you know, artists, creatives. I spoke to, you know, the Economic Development Center in Kingston, you know, all sorts of like government sort of, you know, offices, like anybody who could potentially help me do whatever, right? Mm. And the way that I always described it was I always said, you know, I'm doing this independent art project because my thinking was that I would do this thing, you know, once. And the idea was that it would enable me to meet all these people, enable other people to meet all these people. And that was the goal. And that was it. I was only going to do it the one time. And the success part of it, um, when we opened to the public, um, that was the first thing that kind of blew us away because um, I didn't have a ton of money to do marketing. Yeah. Uh, so I placed the weekend um, during Columbus Day weekend because Columbus Day weekend up here in the Hudson Valley, we have two massively huge events. One is Field and Supply, which is very well known. It's a maker's uh, fair. Uh, Brad Ford, um, who's a very well known designer, who's now is on our board um, of uh, Kingston Design Connection. He had been doing it for about six years. They routinely get like six, 8,000 people on and they're only open for Columbus Day weekend. So over those four days, they get that many people. And then there's another big event called O Positive. And O Positive is sort of a, it's a music festival mm -hmm. that is also tied to mural making. So that there are amazing murals all over sides of building in Kingston. O Positive is responsible for a lot of that. And then there's a piece, piece of it where they trade um, because it's all about kind of artists and healthcare, because a lot of artists don't have the money to have, you know, kind yeah. of health insurance. So that whole weekend, um, the healthcare community provides free sort of healthcare, you know, a variety of healthcare services. Um, so those two events had been going for about five years or so. And so I thought, well, if I sandwich myself between them, I'll get the spillover effect you know, of, you know, all of the attendees they get. And then I went to them and I said, hey, smart. yeah, exactly. And then I went to Very them and smart. I introduced myself and I basically said, hey, can I give you some flyers? You can give me some flyers. We did a little bit of cross promoting, you know, on social media, but not a ton. But that that kind of strategy actually worked. Um, and so the first year we wound up because we're only we're open for three weeks every right. year in October. So we had about 450 attendees that first year, which just blew my mind um, and so and, and and then you know that's year 
was right after the show house ended in October is when all the press started happening. Um, and so I've been working with a publicist, Andrew Joseph, who's from the city and he found me on social media yep. um, right before the show house opened, actually, like maybe a week or two. And he said, hey, you know, I love, you know, what you're trying to do with the community via the show house. Um, I'd love to work with you and help you do some PR. And I said, well, that's wonderful, but I have no money. Um, and then he wound up doing it as a pro bono the first year. And the very first piece of press he got us was Architectural Digest, which was insane that that was like the very first piece of press we got. And then that kind of launched everything. Um, and then, you know, it became very clear to me very quickly that this was going to become an annual thing. Um, and yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, and where is it now? Is it still in the same house or you... No, no. So um, did, you, did you manage to get, get the house back for rental? Or? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So basically um, after that year, I thought, you know, there was a lot of good buzz and I liked the idea of sort of sharing um, kind of interior design more broadly because, you know, interior design tends to, most people don't think they can afford it. It tends to be a certain kind of level of income of folks who are kind of looking at that. Right. And I like the idea of kind of like design for the masses. Yep. Um, and so one thing I thought once I realized I was going to, you know, continue to do this um, was I should go back to my idea of opening it up to the public because as an interior designer, the idea of like, ripping everything out that was so lovingly done in the house. I just couldn't see myself doing it. Um, and so luckily, because the first show house was well received, I did an application process um, the following year, the second year. And we actually got a number of people who submitted their homes because one of the things that's great about that is that though, you know, so if we chose your house, for example, though you'd have to move out for two months, yeah. right? The entire month that the designers are working and then the entire month that it's open, um, because we choose a house every year, you get the benefit of having a brand new custom kitchen, lovely landscaping, the wallpaper, because we don't rip that stuff out. Yeah. And I kind of like the idea of kind of leaving that behind as well, you know, as part of what we provide. So that's what we've been doing. We've been kind of, you know, this is the first year we've, we've done something different. But for the past, uh, the second and third show houses, we opened it up to the public and we use uh, homeowners homes. Amazing. Okay. So the, so the homeowners, they, they make an application basically mm -hmm. to have their house, you know, and they go and stay somewhere else and then you move in and, and, and do it up for them. So they, they basically get the house done up for free essentially. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, I mean, That's they're giving up deal. a lot, but yeah, it's kind of a good deal. I feel. Yep. Yep. <laughs> pretty good deal. And how do you choose, how do you know what's going to make a good house then? So when, when people are applying to you, how do you make the decision? Okay, this is going to be a good house. Is it going to? Is it part location? Make sure that there's enough footfall there, or yeah. looking at the kind of actual architecture of the plot. Yeah, no, absolutely, all of that. Um, you know, we have a, a committee that reviews um, all of our applications, both for the house as well as for mm -hmm. the participants. Um, and yeah, you know, because as interior designers we're not coming in and redoing an entire house inside outside. You know, we have to have, the house has to have a certain level of architectural interest right. going into it. Um, and so that's always something that we look for. Um, the other thing is, if you think of a show house, you know, you have a number. So like last year, we had about 17 different rooms that we did. And every designer is free to do whatever they want in their spaces. Mm. So what that means is you actually want kind of contained rooms, right? So if you had like a big, huge loft um, kind of space, it wouldn't work to have somebody do a kitchen here and a dining room on the other side. Got it. So it helps to have individual spaces, which, you know, the historical homes kind of, you know, were built that way. So that helps. Yeah. Do, and then do, the do, you, do you have like a master plan then? Is, is there one designer who's involved in a kind of the master plan? So the whole house kind of ties together or is it? <laughs> each designer just has their their room segmented off to them and then they decide what they're going to do? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the Kingston Design Show House runs very differently almost on every level than traditional show houses or other show houses do. Mm. Um, yes, you know, designers are free to do whatever they want. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why interior designers love to do show houses because it's an opportunity. You know, you don't have a client. You know, you actually are able to just do whatever you want to do. Um, you know, which we don't get to do in our day jobs. And so that's a big part of why people love doing show houses. Um, but because we use actual people's homes, we don't want the homeowner afterwards to come in and have all these disjointed random spaces. So 
as part of our design brief every year in recognition that we're using an actual person's home and we want them to love it. We don't want them to come in and rip everything out. Um, we've done two things. One is, you know, we have a design brief every year. And if you are, if you have a sight line to another designer space, then those two designers, which is another way to get them to connect, right. actually will have conversations and will pull some thread through. Maybe it's a color or something. Um, which generally, you know, designers don't don't worry about what's happening in the other spaces in the show house. Yeah. But this way, they get to have their individual spaces. But then the homeowner has a space that really kind of works together. Great. So it still still yeah. remains kind of coherent and mm-hmm. brilliant. Um, and 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 so after the show house is well, how do you market the show house then each year in terms of kind of making sure that it it doesn't you know nobody shows up. <laughs> Well, you know, um, the biggest thing I did because I had no money was social media because right. it's free. So before I had the idea for the show house, I'd never been on Instagram or Facebook. Um, and I don't know if I ever would have really thought about being as invested as, as I am um, if it weren't for the show house, because it allowed me to not just have an open platform, but also it allowed me to, to really target an audience, meaning mm-hmm. that, so, you know, our Instagram is Kingston Design Connection, which is the name of our organization. But that Instagram, 90% of it, of followers, we have about 12,000 followers, 90% of those people are creatives and they're in the kind of tri-state area. Um, and so that targeting was huge because, you know, I specifically focus my content on getting up, you know, that audience. Mm -hmm. And then they helped me amplify the message because they knew more makers and designers because they're in that space. Um, So that's been really, really big. And then we've just been, I mean, the press has just been amazing every year. Um, You know, we've just gotten amazing, you know, national press from, you know, House Beautiful to Connie Nast Traveler and then regional press. Um, So that's been really great that, that, you know, that community has really consistently kind of, um, you know, stayed with us. Wonderful. Um, how has it affected your um, Demore Drake? Has, 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 there, has there been a lot of kind of, has it been quite easy to turn some lots of those connections into new projects or? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, one of the big things about, you know, m- my focus for the show house in the beginning was about just meeting all these people. Mm-hmm. Um, it became very clear very quickly that what happened as part of that connection work was that people started supporting each other locally because if I didn't know furniture designers in the Hudson Valley or contractors, and this is what designers were doing, people would go to the city because in the city, it's really easy to find these people. You know, we have a D&D building, for example, you can go and, you know, and, and just kind of see all this stuff. And in the Hudson Valley, you know, it's a large region. You have to drive around everywhere. If I don't know where you are, it's hard for me to find you. Um, so, one of the things that that started happening right away is that people started working together in terms of hiring each other. So every year coming out of the show house, in addition to potential clients, you know, people coming through, um, a lot of what's happened is that, you know, we've had designers come together and start companies who met at the show house. We have contractors who are now working with us on a regular basis, um, you know, painters, wallpaper hangers, tilers. And so it's become a great kind of economic development boost for local businesses because now they know, you know, now they can find each other and support each other. So that's also happened for me as well. Amazing. So where does the, the budget come from to renovate the homes? That come from the, the homeowner themselves or? Yeah, elsewhere? no. So the homeowner, you know, they're doing enough by just turning doing over their house, house to yeah. us. Um, so, you know, show houses, the way they, they work and that the way it works for us as well is if you're an interior designer and you're given a kitchen, um, it is on you as the interior designer to pay for the execution. So all of the contractor services and that stuff. Outfitting the kitchen, um, that happens through various design companies and makers um, who either, so for example, a kitchen, you know, you, you know, for a show house, it's always custom. Yeah. So last year, for example, the interior designer worked with a local woodworking company that does, you know, cabinetry and, and things like that. And so that maker provided that free of charge to actually create that and install it because that was their participation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we got a ton of great press, you know, for both the designer and the makers. So generally all the stuff that you see is either donated. Um, yeah. So like Benjamin Moore, for example, since 2018 has always been um, our sponsor for paint. So they just donate 
70, 80 gallons of paint to us every year. And then a lot of the smaller makers will lend, you know, furniture and artwork and stuff. And then we kind of give those back at the end of the show house. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and obviously the, the, the more kind of press that you're generating each each year with it, it becomes more and more of a desired um, thing that people want to be contributing to. And, you'll, you know, you get the you get the investment back. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, one of the things um, like one of the little nuts I've been trying to crack, because, you know, if you think about it, the interior designer generally gets most of the press. Right. Because yeah. they're the ones that are curating the space and the makers who participate in, and the local businesses. Um, yes, they care about the press, but they really want to sell, you know, yeah. they really want to sell their actual products. Um, and that's been a hard thing for me to figure out how to do that via the show house in any kind of substantive way. So yeah. like, in the, you know, so I've tried, for example, doing auctions and, you know, people make a little bit of money, but not much. Um, this year, very, very exciting for the show house for the first time, we're partnering with Field and Supply because in addition to doing you know, that Columbus Day weekend maker fair, Field and Supply, has a very robust e-commerce site where they actually source makers from all over the place, um, you know, furniture, lighting, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And because they have such a great platform, um, it's a great vehicle for makers for their work to be seen and to actually sell. And so this year, together with Field and Supply, we created um, a special Shop the Show House um, so, you know, when the show house opens, we'll have a shop the show house page on fieldandsupply.com for all the participating makers. And then that, that page will be up through the end of the year. And for a lot of makers to have that massive platform will be great. Um, because field and supply, you know, is like I said, it's very well known, et cetera. And so it's a lot more eyeballs. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping that, that, you know, the makers will have an opportunity to, to make some sales that way this year. Brilliant. So it becomes like a, a digital resource as well, or a digital, a digital showroom. Yep, exactly. Well, which is kind of anchored in, in something, in something real. Um, it, it's been really, it's really, really, it's such a brilliant uh, initiative and idea. Um, I, I noticed here as well, you're also part of the, the design, uh, Kingston Design Connection. What is, what is that and how does that relate to the show house? Um, so Kingston Design Connection. So, you know, how I said before that this was an independent project that I was yeah. that I was only doing for a year. That is true. But because I'm a consultant, it's really hard for me to create something without a long term plan. Yeah. So even though I was only doing this for a year um, in my head, I created an organization called Kingston Design Connection. Um, under which the show house is one of the things, key activities that we do every year. Right. Um, but from the very beginning, it occurred to me that there were other kind of things that could come out of the show house. So, for example, you know, after three years of doing the show house, we've engaged maybe four or five hundred participants. Um, and so we've been thinking about pulling that together into some kind of a directory because now we can have a design directory, you know, for the Hudson Valley that's been vetted. People can come see their work. We have pictures posted on our website. And so it occurred to me that there were lots of stuff that could come out of that. Mm -hmm. And that if I had a, a, a superstructure, then th that, you know, then that could happen. Um, and so the next year, when it became clear that, that this was going to continue to happen because, you know, people were interested in continuing it, um, because I'd already set up Kingston Design Connection, I thought, well, okay, this can't just be me anymore. Cause the first year, you know, I chose the house, I chose all the participants, you know, I chose all the makers, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, well, okay, if this is a real thing. It has to engage more people. It can't just be just my kind of little vision because there's only so much you can think of, you know, on your own. Yeah. Um, and so I pulled together a board of advisors. Um, so Brad Ford, I mentioned, who's the founder of Field of Supplies on it. Sheila Bridges is a very well-known designer. So, you know, very well-established internationally known designers, but who also have a kind of a deep connection to the Hudson Valley because they work here or, or live here um, in some instances. And so I created that sort of organization, you know, and had a logo and a name and all that good stuff in case I was able to actually kind of do more with it. And so this year, actually, we just incorporated and um, we're applying for nonprofit status. But, you know, that long term, just even just a kind of a straw man idea, the long term approach mm -hmm. allowed me to actually continue to grow it in a valuable way. Um, as it was kind of scrambling saying, oh, my God, now it's an annual thing. What do I do? You know, how do I figure yeah. this out? Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, so what's, what's happening this year? What's next? 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, people talk about the show house all the time, but the show house, you know, happens once a year for three weeks. It engages yeah. however many people it engages. But throughout the rest of the year, Kingston Design Connection, we actually do a number um, of other activities like smaller pop up design events where, where we can actually engage some other folks. Um, I recently started doing a radio show and the radio show is all about um, talking to creatives about their work, but also about the business of being creative and how you actually grow a business, yeah. um, you know, in terms of, you know, planning and marketing, you know, all that's good stuff that a lot of artists um, are not necessarily trained to do. Yeah. Um, and so we find lots of ways to continue to provide information and support for the creatives in addition to the once a year um, show house. Brilliant. Absolutely. Absolutely love it. What kind of uh, other creatives or disciplines are you speaking with? Um, you know, so I used to be um, a chef in a, in a past life. I was also, an, you know, I also acted, you know, I, I, I was a belly dancer for a while. So my definition of creatives is incredibly broad. And in yeah. fact, when I did the show house from the very first year, um, which is also something that show houses don't do because show houses are for interior designers. And because I'm the kind of person that likes to do a lot of different things, in my head, I don't consider myself just an interior designer. So I opened it up, and, and, and we still do this today, to creatives, period, right? So we've had product designers, we've had set designers, interior designers. And to me, that's kind of the wealth of, of kind of the creative community. Because, yes, you can learn a lot from another interior designer, but the perspective of somebody who like, for example, we had a graphic designer last year, never had a graphic designer before. Yeah. And she's done, a, she's done amazing graphic design for very, very well-known international brands. Um, and she's interested in interior design because, you know, visual people tend to be very curious. But to be able to see how she approached a space, you know, we all learn, learn a lot from various, you know, disciplines that way. And I think that's a pretty cool thing to do. Amazing. Brilliant. So um, in, in terms of uh, the projects that you're currently working on in Demore Drake, um, what sorts of things are you focused on this year? Um, so because we're a design build company, that's the kind of work that we always get. Like I would love to have a pure decorating project, yeah. but you know, people come to us because we're design build. So we're either doing, we're either building you a house from the ground up. And I mean that literally excavating foundation framing. We do all that stuff in house. Um, and then, you know, we also do the interiors or we do kind of big renovation work. So for example, um, the last project that we were almost close to wrapping up, we, um, we had our client bought a lovely, lovely house, but that was very dated on the, in the interior. Mm-hmm. But the house had, had really good sort of modern, modern bones to it. Yep. And they kind of wanted to take it in that direction. So on the ground floor of their space, which is kind of their main living room, dining room, kitchen, we blew out, I think, three walls and basically created kind of a big kind of Soho loft space. Um, they're on top of a hill. They have these amazing views, like rolling, kind of like England, like rolling hills and, you know, all that lovely stuff. Yeah. Um, but they only had like going out into their deck, they had one French door and one window. So we took that entire exterior wall away, replaced it with, I think it was like 17 feet of glass doors that now slide open. Um, so that's kind of the level of, of work that we tend to do. But like I said, you know, call me because I would love to do a decorating job, <laughs> you know, because obviously I don't have to do all of the crazy math and all the stuff that you have to do on the design build side. It can be a little bit, you know, yeah. more focus on color and, f- and fabric and all that fun stuff. Amazing. And, and in, in terms of the, the kind of running of the, the construction side of the business, obviously that, that can become, you know, that's a, a as far as businesses goes, coordinating a building site gets pretty complex. Can get- yeah, yeah. You know, um, we've had just huge influx of of people moving to this area. In fact, I read a stat recently that in Kingston, where I live, yeah, um, it had the highest number of people moving in this past year of any zip code in the country. So it's been huge for the design build industry up, up here. Everybody's buying. Everybody's building. Um, so we definitely have kind of seen that, um, happen over the past few years and it's changed a little bit of, of the kind of work we do. Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, as people move in from everywhere, we're seeing lots of different styles, you know, there's a lot, people are asking a lot more for kind of modern open spaces versus the traditional, what you'd expect in the Hudson Valley, kind of more log cabins or, you know, kind of more historical sort of homes. Um, 
you know, we're, we're definitely seeing a shift in people wanting, you know, kind of different, more modern type spaces, which is fun. Fantastic. And did, did COVID hamper many plans over the last year? Um, you know, we got really lucky. Kingston was, was actually very, very good. We, we never really had crazy numbers mm-hmm. and we opened very safely. And so, you know, a lot of show houses last year went virtual and we actually opened up to the public um, and we were able to do that because, you know, the situation <clears throat> allowed us to do that. So, um, you know, we also did a virtual tour last year for the first time, just because just, you know, because some people were just too nervous to come out. Sure. But it was very, very exciting that we were able to actually open up to the public. And we wrestled a lot with that internally about, you know, if we couldn't open to the public, would we still do it? Because, you know, folks watch HGTV and people get design magazines, but a lot of people have never been standing in the middle of an intentionally designed space, right? That experience is there's nothing that can beat that. Um, and, and especially because, you know, in a design show house, you know, I mean, designers are always so thoughtful, but there are so many little things that you have to be in the room to really appreciate how things are working together. So it was great that we were able to actually open to the public. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, I think that's the, the perfect place for us to conclude the, the conversation there, um, Marilyn. That's, that's a, a, such a brilliant um, initiative. And I love the way how you've kind of created they're they're pretty much like businesses in themselves each of these entrepreneurial projects um Um, yeah kind of i guess actually you know i have one more thing i'd love to mention because this is super exciting for us this year so like i said you know we've always used homeowners houses you know mine (laughs) was included in that yeah so this year for the first time we're doing something very very different um and it's a conversation i started having with uh this nonprofit last year um, it's called the Kingston City Land Bank, and it's a nonprofit, and their job is to create affordable sort of um, homes for first-time home buyers. And as a result of the pandemic and all of these people moving in, property, you know, property prices have just gone through the roof. Yeah. You know, and it's hard to find houses now, whether for, for sale or even to rent, it's hard to find. And what's been happening is that a lot of the folks who have been here for a long time are getting pushed out. You know, I lived in Brooklyn. I went through that whole situation, right, with gentrification and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, so the Kingston City Land Bank, um, one of the things that they do is that um, <clears throat> for these homes that have just been sitting, um, that either kind of got taken back for various reasons by the city, um, et cetera, et cetera, they actually um, have a grant and they are renovating these homes and then putting them back on the market, but at way below market value to allow kind of long-term residents and people, you know, who are first-time home buyers to actually be able to participate and stay in Kingston. Um, So last year we spoke with them. And so this year um, the house that we're using is a house that the Kingston Land Bank is actually renovating. And so we're partnering. Yeah. So we're partnering with them. They're doing, because if we weren't in the mix, they do the entire house inside outside. So they're focusing on the exterior, on the structural stuff. And then we get to save them their interiors budget because we're coming in and we're using it as the show house. But then that allows the Kingston City Land Bank to have, um, you know, that extra resource and also that extra time to do more homes in a faster time frame um, so that people have an opportunity to really have affordable housing in Kingston. So it's very, very exciting. That's amazing. Brilliant. Very cool. Excellent. Well, Marilyn, thank you so much for sharing the insights behind the, the show house and uh, the K- Kingston Design Connection and the formation of um, the more Drake. Thoroughly enjoyed listening to your insights and expertise. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on. And I should mention that, you know, our fourth annual isn't this October. We're right in the middle of the application process. So if anybody's interested in kind of, um, you know, checking us out or participating, if you go to kingstondesignconnection.com, the application form is there. I think we're extending the application to the end of July. Um, And we have a great national media sponsor this year, which is Aspire Design and Home. Um, So we're looking forward to getting some good press again. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So, so this is applications for both the designers and for the, uh, makers. Yeah. And for the makers. But yep, the house, exactly. But the, the land and the house is already sorted. Yeah. Yeah. So the house we for have. Absolutely. Part. Yep. So now it's all about getting all the amazing creatives um, to come in and do their, their work. Love it. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. 
And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.